no small victory. Often my life feels like a series of small victories. Mothering three young children requires a lot of negotiations. And while I hope for win-win scenarios where the kids and I feel equally satisfied, in the end, I'm still looking for victories. One benefit I've learned from 12 years of parenting is which battles to pick. As soon as the alarm sounds, usually four-year-old Truman climbing in bed next to me, laying his hand on my cheek, whispering, Mommy, are you awake? <laughs> the quest for victory begins. We start with three kids to get out the door to three different schools at three different times. I cross my fingers that picking out their clothes will be smooth. It seems that Truman only wants to wear stripes, and of course no striped clothes are clean. Maybe just for today you can wear a dump truck t-shirt I offer. Geneva, who is 12 years old, has an aversion to most socks. They never feel good on her feet, so I hope that each morning her socks will go on her feet without my having to hear about it. And as a family, we negotiate with and overcome these sorts of obstacles all day long. What? Truman thought it was his turn to close the garage door. More negotiations ensue. Next time, little man. What? You don't have to go to the bathroom before a long car ride? Well, your bladder is about the size of a lima bean, so how about you get in there and use the potty anyway? <laughs> of course, I've learned the fine art of giving the kids the illusion of choice. When they're young, it's, do you want to drink from a blue cup or a red cup? Either way, they're drinking what I've chosen. With the oldest, it's, would you like your friends to sleep over Friday night or Saturday night? The goal was one sleepover night, not two, as would otherwise have been requested. And with my sweet, special Juki, victories are non-stop. Much of my time with Juki involves simply trying to control the chaos he creates while allowing him as much freedom as possible and with minimum damage to our books and furniture. We've put a lot of thought and energy into exploring how we as a family can coexist happily with as many win-win outcomes as possible. And when I am on Juki duty, the negotiations are active and constant. As a result, I rarely sit down. Who needs a gym? <laughs> Sometimes I fancy myself as undergoing the training of a world-class athlete, though perhaps one who never gets to leave the Olympic Village. I have always hoped that these constant little trials would prepare me to compete when my time comes. Such was the case when I encountered an unexpected opponent in the form of Juki's County Regional Center, Alta California Regional Center. In California, budgets everywhere are depleted, so perhaps we should not have been surprised when the center charged to support children with disabilities informed us that they would no longer be funding Juki's care track monitoring system, an ankle bracelet that emits a radio signal so that Juki can be tracked by the local police department everywhere he goes. We were told that the same technology is used to track caribou in the Yukon. <laughs> Juki has a history of running away from his helicopter parents, the same way that the caribou run away from helicopters. <laughs> Ergo, this bracelet is vital. After telling us that the Alta California Regional Center was planning to cancel support for the program, which a local activist and mom raised the money to initiate, the Alta staff offered a series of silly compensatory suggestions. Why not install an elevated lock on the front door? <laughs> Have we tried behavior modification? What about direct supervision? <laughs> Gee. Why didn't we think of any of those solutions? <laughs> Anyone who spends even five minutes with Juki can see what an enthusiastic climber he is and how easily he would have defeated that front door lock tactic, which he began to do in preschool. And behavior modification. We had been modifying Juki's behavior with the help of every professional we could enlist for the previous nine years. Alta's suggestion that there is no substitute for direct supervision felt like an especially cruel joke. 
My husband Andy and I are human. We require sleep each night. <laughs> of course, we directly supervise our boy every minute of the day. He even sleeps with a night vision monitor on his bed. Some days are so exhausting that Juki TV is the only channel we've had the energy to watch. With all of our vigilance, Juki has still escaped twice. Round one. Andy and I met informally with altar representatives to try to come to a resolution without involving the courts. Because we believed that Alta would listen to our reasonable argument that the agency should continue to fund the monthly cost of his ankle bracelet, we agreed to this meeting. This turned out to be a naive mistake that we would not make again. Alta's legal consultant, their impartial arbiter, acted as judge for this informal hearing. This didn't bode well, but the woman seemed friendly enough. We brought with us the coordinator of the care track program, a wonderful police officer. Along with us, she spoke of the necessity of care track and demonstrated the pings coming from her monitoring device. Like so many of Juki's sounds, these little beeps were unique to Juki. Did I mention we also brought Juki? <laughs> if the Alta folks were to understand our argument, they need to see and meet Juki. Surely they conclude that our little wordless escape artist, our domestic insurgent, needed to continue to be monitored via care track and our local police force. The meeting took about an hour, during which time Juki ran around in circles, tried to climb the blinds, untied everyone's shoelaces, <laughs> and ate from the trash can. I remember thinking, you go, Juki, show them what you got. <laughs> and let them see what a precious little boy you are, so worthy of tracking. As we left the building that day, I said to Andy and to our trusty police officer, I'd be shocked if they didn't rule in our favor. One week later, we heard Alta's decision. Funding for the care track service was denied. Did we still want to pursue this, they asked. I imagine that at this point, many parents would understandably give up. These sorts of battles require large amounts of time, energy, and perseverance. Taking the matter to court before a judge can feel incredibly intimidating. Did I want to pursue the matter? Absolutely. <laughs> pursue. Round two. Once again, Andy Juki, our police officer, and I reconvened. This time sworn in, speaking into microphones and before a judge. To our surprise, our Alta opposition, the opposing counsel, if you will, was led by the impartial arbiter from our previous encounter. <laughs> now as prosecutor, she used every argument against us that we had made in our previous informal meeting. Andy and I have no law background unless you count watching an occasional trial on TV. <laughs> Hello, OJ. We thought we'd just be explaining ourselves directly to a judge. Instead, we found that our hearing would be conducted like a real court case, which, in retrospect, it was. Opening statements, called witnesses, cross-examinations, objections. Quickly realizing that Andy and I were out of our comfort zone, not to mention our league, we decided to step up and act the part. How about if I play lawyer and you play witness? Andy whispered. Fortunately, Andy's a seasoned public speaker, quite used to running meetings, and of course, I knew the ins and outs of the case. We could do it. While Alta was presenting their case against us, I feverishly wrote down a long list of questions for my newly appointed lawyer to ask me. Alta began making the case that because Juki wears a medic alert bracelet, funding the care track monitoring system would be a duplication of services. <laughs> Again, we heard about the importance of direct supervision. Our friendly prosecutor pointed out that I had turned down a referral for behavior modification, which she made sound terribly irresponsible of me. 
We couldn't wait for our turn to speak. Soon enough, Annie was cross-examining Alta with fabulous questions such as, is Juki wearing a medic alert bracelet right now? They couldn't say, for as the woman from Alta was forced to admit, she could not see the bracelet under Juki's sleeve. If you saw Juki sitting quietly playing alone in the sand at a park, would you know immediately that he needed intervention, he asked. No, she admitted, she would not. We remember well that sitting alone and playing quietly in the sand was exactly what Juki was doing when a year earlier he was found at Playfields Park, a favorite family destination that was a mile from our home. He had climbed our eight-foot fence. When it was our turn to testify, I pointed out that the medic alert bracelet kicks in when Juki's found. The care track anklet is activated the moment he is lost. Juki doesn't speak. He doesn't fear traffic or people or most any other danger he should. I told the judge that Juki had proven his own case. He had already demonstrated the importance of tracking him. His police officer testified again. The whole case went on for over two hours. A funny thing happened when we left the court that day. I felt exuberant. Whatever happened, we felt as if we had already won. Andy and I came together over yet another obstacle. We found that we had enjoyed playing lawyer by reading each other's minds to make up for the absence of preparation. Helped by our 22 years together. We stood up for and with Juki and for all the children in the county who used the care track system. Even more than that, we tested the mettle of our unusual family. I think often of that Martin Luther King quotation that the ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in the moments of comfort and convenience, but where he stands at times of challenge and controversy. Our life with Juki has been an exhausting series of battles and challenges, one that has prepared us to band together and to stand strong. Our family of salmon has only ever swum upstream. Sometimes we even prefer it that way. A few weeks after Juki's trial, as we called it, I walked into the post office and knew that the certified letter waiting there must be from the court. Letter in hand, I ran back to my bike and decided to wait to open it until I arrived home. But I didn't make it home. <laughs> I couldn't wait. Instead, I stopped at a bench on the Davis Greenbelt and ripped open the envelope. The first words I saw were, claimant's appeal is granted. We won. Juki won. Yes, precious boy, you won. You are worthy of tracking. I will follow you everywhere. He is my entropy elephant, my kangaroo of chaos. The contents of all drawers will be revealed. All the shirts become t-shirts, all the gowns strapless. Water seeks its own level and this boy is a guide. If a tree falls in the forest, run to take the axe from his hands. If the water main has broken, then he has taken a break. Left-handed people are sinister and clumsy, they say, while our little lefty hoorays the lightning strike, the wind shear. We get no rest from this tempest. The nanny cries. It's not their stuff. So the neighbors just sit back and watch, thinking, with that arm, he could pitch for the giants. I never knew the pliers could be used in that way. We can find no matches for his socks, his shoes, his mittens. He plays with matches. How will we ever find him a match? Thank you. Here's part two. I'm calling it five parts instead of pretending that I'm just reading five poems to you. <laughs> Chaucer said <clears throat> that the tongue returns to the sore tooth 
And often I find myself starting to write about a topic, and I come back to writing about Juki. I imagined a story about a, uh, a young man in Boston who was causing trouble at Faneuil Hall. And this was in response to an assignment that I had given my students where I asked them to write an entire poem made up of one sentence where all the lines rhymed. And they said, you know, that's just cruel, Dr. Andrew. Can you do that? And I'd say, yes. For instance, this poem is called Spilled Fennel in Faneuil. Uncomfortable, squarish, Hard scrabble, hungry Henry Tippet tripped on the tinsel and jolted into fandango, a dangerous shuffle, an ungentle joggle, <coughs> awkward, inadmissible, spinning counterclockwise amid the truffles, chestnut pies, gold coins spilled in the temple, spent fennel, he up and peeled off in Faneuil Hall, where Paul Revere smithed silver, where he stood watchful with wary rifle, and stands today an unweary sentinel, mythic colonel fixed in black marble, still as death above the slowing people, gasping and pointing amid the spilled fennel, amid the grasping, tripping tinsel, as Henry Tippett, dynamic but unjoyful, spins there, unleashed, unkenneled, mistaken once as an unsought example of merely the minutely poor people. He now jerks free in the Christmas temple, unleashed now like a counterexample, clearly uncoupled, perversely unpoliceable. He is both simple and anything but simple. Yes. Part three is a long poem called The Last Pterodactyl. Once I told Kate that an event that she was going to attend was going to include this poem, and she said, are you trying to kill me? <laughs> So if you have tears, prepare to shed them now. Mostly I say that to myself. The last pterodactyl. Tosis, tosis, tosis. P-T-O-S-I-S. -S. Tosis. I must have said the word a thousand times, explaining why my boy's eyes looked like that. Semantic satiation, the linguists call it. That disappointment one has with a word when it loses meaning through repetition like a thousand silent peas. The word tosis comes from the Greeks, their word that means to fall. Did ancient Greeks pronounce the vestigial P? With tosis, the eyelid falls too early, decades earlier than one would expect, like heavy curtains coming down before the actor has had a chance to speak. He couldn't keep our, <clears throat> he couldn't keep his eyes open, our baby boy. Just like me, up with him in the middle of the night during those first weeks of adoration when nobody slept, both of us instead staring at our little Yoda with the wise eyes and fused toes. Everyone has something, the doctor reminded us. Of the baby, one kind old woman peered into the stroller and said helpfully that he had Asian eyes. He stared at her, Eastwood-like, and couldn't be convinced to smile. They accused Juki's grandfather of having Jap eyes during World War II. Hurtful children know just what to say. We can't choose how we look, he reminded the other boys before they beat him. In this case, surgery would protect my son's vision from greater problems, if not from eventual ridicule. Surgery at age three. 
unless we elected to have it removed from his own thigh, a donor would provide the tissue, a preserved bit of an unknown motorist. It didn't make sense to tell him what was coming. At three years old, heavy-lidded Juki had to look up to see forward, but that didn't slow his gait. Sometimes he would walk into walls. The dime store novel gumshoe kept his hat's brim low over his eyes so as not to be seen. It was like that, his ptosis. To see what was going on, Juki would climb to the highest available point, bunk bed, play structure, climbing wall, and sit up there like the statue of the Buddha. We built a ladder on the wall of his room. Imagine being the last pterodactyl, gliding above the smoke after the incident, nowhere to land, looking for anyone who looks like you, elevated desperation. Sometimes those paleontologists were just mean, mocking those beasts with their unpronounceable names. Pterodactyl in Greek, pteron meaning wing, and dactylos meaning finger. The wing finger is where Elmer Fudd wished to wear a wedding ring. The silly man couldn't speak correctly and never found love. Juki's language was a bell curve, only we didn't know it. At the top of the bell, he called out to his Grammy Joe by name. A year later, he said, all done. And he was. Mm -hmm. Grammy Joe came to help us recover from the surgery and showed us how to Velcro the no-nos to his arms, gauntlets, from an armor of straitjacket, rigid torture of the unknowing. During the cries and the pleas and his ever-narrowing cycle of words, the arms stayed straight and the minute stitches binding dead tissue from eyebrow to lid remained disturbing but undisturbed. His eyes were undisturbed. Jim Henson's puppets had to solve problems or they would die. The geeful and the gonk talk anxiously beneath the nectarine tree, the only food on planet Snoo. The gonk is too short, while the elbowless geeful can't bend his arms. So unfair, this lesson. The Sesame Street aliens worked it out one dislodging nectarines while the other feeds them both. The cooperation lesson has been learned, but not every planet comes with complementary aliens. Two of us to hold him down, while the third applies the salve to the wounds of the unclosable eyes. Every hour he screams, in outrage when we do it to him. Our prize fighter cannot throw a punch, but his days of automatic blinking are over. We see his pupils as he sleeps, his eyes frozen in a scream. Ptolemy fixed his eyes on the stars. Ptolemy was a Macedonian name, and with Alexander it spread across the land. Ptolemy imagined himself standing at the foot of Zeus, though he never left Alexandria, founded by the former boy king, a perfect place to legitimize astrology. So many libraries burned in that city that gasped with each loss and then had its stories silenced. Even the Pope took his turn torching a library of Egypt ensuring that something would not be shared. Tosis, ptarmigan, pteranodons, 
those ambitious Greeks with their strange PT combinations. In Latin, these words would have been spelled like pertussis, in Latin, per, and tussis, cough, thoroughly, and cough, pertussis. Juki coughed and coughed his way to the doctor, the only time he rode in his grandfather's PT cruiser, the car seat installation taking 20 minutes. He was told not to wet the leather. Ptolemy thought that he was the center. Someone tried to say goodbye to Juki once, perched at the top of the play structure in the backyard, lost in thought, and refusing to talk, clutching Big Bird. Big Bird, a name he used to speak to us when he would point to things. There was a time when Juki wanted to show us things. Once, Big Bird asked Gordon if he was indeed a bird, for he towered over all the other creatures on his street, and he couldn't fly at all. Thank you, that's part three of five. Part four, Sunday in the Backyard. There's a wonderful poetry series at the Avid Reader in Sacramento that takes place on Sundays. And sometimes I feel the looks of neighbors when I'm taking Juki out for a walk on a Sunday morning and I'm just imagining that they're asking me with their eyes, why aren't you in church? And I want to say, you know, we're going to a poetry reading later in Sacramento. Why aren't you ever at the poetry reading? <laughs> <laughs> so this poem is a little bit about that. It's called Sunday in the Backyard. A blur of a boy in new clothes, superhero themed, sent by grandparents, races round and round the backyard, shaded by fences eight feet tall. Far above, the lichens and birds' nests call to him. Next to the picnic table, our boy baptizes the bulldog, his unwilling and unsturdy steed. The praise he sings with gospel lungs rings sympathetic with the morning's distant soccer game cheers and nearby yellow-billed magpies. Our pale angel, brandishing wooden spoons, knocks doggedly on the garden gates, dark cedar with cross beams resembling ladder rungs. Wishing for some place more remote, a place beyond the memorized and mangy lawn, he imagines a jubilee where dragonflies and honey are their own reward, a celebration of unremembered sunshine, sublime and jaunty in the gallops of air that gleam beyond ego, beyond experience. Who's to say that this boy, unworded and noisy mystic, keeper of everyone's secrets, chronicled unlearner, does not commune hourly with an aspect of God. This is part five and the final bit that I'll read for you tonight. Shakespeare has a number of sonnets in which he says, and I'm paraphrasing badly, you, young man, I so enjoy our time together. Nevertheless, you should go out into the world and procreate because someone as gorgeous as you really needs to have children and hopefully they'll look like you. I release you. Go. I was thinking of Sonnet uh, 13 when uh, I wrote this poem and uh, Shakespeare's speaker's, uh, speaker's um, assertion that uh, beautiful people should uh, have children. It's called Sleeping in a Field of Un, and Un is U-N hyphenated, as you'll see why in a minute. Sleeping in a Field of Un. Exempted from ownership, you are sweetly unaware of endings. Yours is a semblance of life. 
Do you belong to yourself? Stormy gusts provoke no thoughts of unanticipated husbandry, no thoughts of the deceased, or even the act of deceasing. The trees branch a thousand patterns, unwrinkled, uncreased, unencumbered, unprepared, so much un. The absences pile up in your silence. My dear love, I am your father. Like you, your son will never say so. Thank you very much. <laughs>